Colossians chapter 3, if you join me there, if I haven't already told you that, uh, Colossians chapter 3, and uh, that exactly is the title of this in Col Colossians chapter 3, verse 12, and uh, verses 13 and 14 as well. Uh, tonight, we are talking about living like a Christian, living like a Christian. I asked you this uh, last time, how many of you uh, uh, have been saved, but somewhere during the time of your salvation, somewhere, somehow, some way, uh, not to asking what the event was, but you were saved, but you didn't act maybe at that moment uh, like a Christian, and you are readily to be honest about it tonight. Can I see your hand raised? All right. Well, this message is fitting for all of us because we know all of us have been here. And uh, look at verse 12 and uh, what the Apostle Paul, who's the writer of this epistle, this letter, says this, Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, those who belong to Jesus, holy and beloved, that's who you are, that is your identity, bowels of mercy, put on kindness, put on humbleness of mind, put on meekness, and put on long suffering. Uh, the Apostle Paul brings us to our attention that there needs to be a putting on of something, but then he also reminds us that there had to be a putting off. And you can see that in the prior verses of what to put off, and we have talked about that in detail, and we sure uh, don't want to make a miss of that, but we know that there is a putting off, putting off the old man, putting off who you were before Christ. If you cursed uh, before you were saved, uh, that is not the language or mouth of a Christian. Your mouth belongs to Jesus now, and it should speak one like Jesus. Uh, your heart that may have been full of envy and bitterness and anger and, and or meanness, and uh, uh, some of you may have been mean uh, before you were saved. Some of you might still be a little bit mean, but you're a lot nicer now. And I want you to know that Jesus will put niceness in you. Aren't you thankful for that? I'm thankful that Jesus puts nice in mean people. And uh, you may find it hard to believe, but I used to be a very mean person. And, uh, um, and sometimes I probably can be, uh, uh, you know, at times. Um, but I really, really used to be a mean person. And uh, uh, before I was saved, um, there were things about my life that, uh, uh, whether it involved fighting or whatever, uh, I, I actually took joy in that. Um, I li I'd like to fight, and I would pick fight, I would settle fights, and uh, to be honest with you, there were times that I was just mean to people and things just to be mean. And uh, that was a sinful nature. I take no pride in that. I give no glory uh, uh, in the flesh to that at all. I'm just admitting to you tonight that that's not who I am today. And the reason that I'm not that person today is because Jesus put on the new man. Jesus made a difference in my life. And it took a period. Now, there, I, I didn't turn nice overnight. And, and by the way, it's a process of growing and maturing in Christ. And some of you may be on that journey as well. Uh, you are maturing. There are things that you are still overcoming. I know that God took care of the sin problem immediately in my life when I trusted Christ as my Savior. But I want to remind you that there are habits in my life that have taken time to overcome because of sinfulness. And I am thankful that Jesus will put a new heart in you and that Jesus will put a new desire in you. Things that you used to do, you no longer want to do those things that displease God. And so that is the putting on of Jesus Christ. And I've told you over the last week that there are some motives for living like a Christian. And one is just being the elect of God. And uh, notice that a person who belongs to Jesus. He says, therefore, as the elect of God. Paul is writing to believers. This is your email. This is a text, if you will, to you. This is your direct mail. God is writing you a letter through the Apostle Paul, and he's letting you know, Hey, Christian, I need you to tune in. I need you to look at this. I need you to pay attention. And I want you to know that you that belong to me, and I praise God that he loves sinners. Amen to that. I'm thankful that Jesus is a friend of sinners. But I want you to know it's also all by grace and for his glory that I have been brought into the family of God. But I love this because he sets me apart. Uh, my identity is no longer... 
uh, attached to my past. And by the way, I have a past. And I have to tell you about my past. Some of you have never been a part of my past. And I'm thankful for that. Because some of my past is embarrassing. And I don't want to go back and live that. As a matter of fact, that's why I talk very little about my past. Because I don't like to review it. I don't want to talk about it. Yeah, I did it in shamefulness. I did it in sinfulness. But I also want you to know that when I came in Christ, when I became a, a part of God's family, when I became an elect of God, the Bible says, holy and beloved. There was a separating a detachment from the past and I was made new in Christ I became holy and beloved can you imagine that I became holy what are you kidding me and, and, and why because of the holiness of Christ not my own this is my identity in Christ this is not my identity in Larry Luffman by the way that's not your identity in you this is your identity in Christ. You are holy and beloved. You're set apart. And by the way, you are loved by God. And no one loves you like God loves you. People are finicky, are they not? We're talking about love on Sunday morning. People love you sometimes based on circumstances. God's never loved you that way. God loved you in your nastiness. God loved you in your greediness. God loved you in your filthiness. God loved you in your hate towards one another. God still loved you. And by the way, you can't do anything. This blows my mind. God, you can't do anything to stop God from loving you. That's amazing to me. I bet I can do something right now to make you stop loving me. For a moment anyway, right? We can do that. But not with God, I can't. Why? He loves me. He loves me. He is committed to me. And he set me apart. I am the object and you are the object of God's heart. That was the, obviously the motive. I, 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 that's the reason why we live like a Christian because of who we are and who we belong to. But do you remember the method for living like a Christian? Notice verse 12. Remember bowels of mercy. Your deep, deep emotions. You ever been so sad that it hurt way down deep? Not just your heart, but your gut hurt. Boy, you felt sick to your stomach. All right, you're supposed to finish the sentence. No one, I feel sick to my heart. Isn't that something? People don't say I'm sick to my heart. But yet your heart hurts. But, oh man, and it was so bad it made me sick to my stomach. What are they talking about? In their most inner uh, uh, feeling, uh, the most tender feelings uh, emotionally in them. Bowels of mercy. These are things that we should put on. This is the method of living like a Christian. Notice he also says uh, not just uh, bowels of mercy, but then he says kindness. You know what that is? That's taking what you feel and now putting in action. Kindness, by the way, is grace in action. I want you to know Jesus didn't just tell me he loved me. Romans 5 8 says he proved he loved me. God committed his love toward me that in while yet I was a sinner. While I was a sinner the Bible says Christ died for me. I want you to know this is grace. This is kindness. The cross of Calvary is kindness in actions. And I'm so thankful for that. Do you remember the story where I told you last time of David's treatment to uh, Mephibosheth? Man, a, a person who was lame on both his feet. And David was compassionate. He was kind and he proved it to this individual that was discounted by others. But it's not just bowels of mercy. And it's not just kindness that you should put on. Notice the next word, humbleness of mind. Notice that phrase, humbleness of mind. Would you say that? Humbleness of mind. I want to share this with you. The pagan world of Paul's day, when Paul wrote this, very pagan culture, very pagan world that he lived in, did not admire humility. And by the way, I don't believe that the world has changed on that. Uh, often it's the person who is humble uh, doesn't uh, uh, get to go first. Usually they're always last. It's usually the one who's arrogant and cocky. 
And it's usually the one who is, uh, uh, that trades up on someone or really kind of steps on someone else. It's kind of that way that it's up the uh, um, uh, business ladder, if you will. See, in Paul's day, they admired the proud and the powerful. They elevated positions and prosperity to the place of prominence in their life. Uh, they didn't care for this type of wording. And uh, this quality causes a person to see himself when a person who is humbleness of mind, a person who exhibits humbleness of mind, is a person who sees himself as the object of divine grace. That's a person who is humble, knowing that they didn't get where they are because of who they are. They got where they were because of Jesus Christ and what He has done for them. See, the Bible says that God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And I want you to know that the way that a person thinks is very important. The way you think is very important. And any act of kindness done without humility will lose its worth in value. Have you ever known someone or had someone do something that was seemingly an act of kindness, but you know they didn't mean it? <laughs> you know that it wasn't genuine. Maybe they had to do it. Maybe uh, uh, we have had people that have been, uh, that come here at times and have to get a paper signed by us. And in trade-off to get that paper signed, they have to do some type of uh, community service. But what I have found is in trying to get that paper signed, they won't oftentimes. It is a rarity to find someone who's willing to do it because they need to do it instead of just doing it because they were told to do it. So I just want to get this over, folks. I just want to have to get this paper signed. I want to do as least as possible. Well, yeah, we have plenty of things around here for you to do, but it looks like you've got to do 16 hours. And by the way, uh, we're not going to do 16 hours in one day, so we're going to split this up for you over the next three days. What? I got to come back? You sure do. Now, if you don't want it to be here, that's fine. You can do it somewhere else, but... Um, your first four hours of community service is going to be just, we need you to vacuum. And for the first hour, you know what? That's not a problem for them. Matter of fact, they're like, vacuum, man, that's easy peasy. I got this lick, man. This church is easy. And then they come in here and they start on that side. And about two hours in, they're only about right here. And then they start to realize... This is going to be a long four hours, and i got to come back. See, a person who is humble realizes that they have what they have, not because they have been all that great, but because as a Christian, if they're a Christian, because of what God has done for them. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Humbleness is rare. But Paul says, put on therefore, not just kindness, not just bowels of mercy, but humbleness of mind. You know, Christ is the best example of humility, is he not? The Bible says in Philippians 2, now you listen to this. Who took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of of the cross. What a humble Savior we have. Our Jesus wasn't cocky, folks. Our Jesus wasn't prideful. And by the way, if he was, then he's not God. But he wasn't. He was all God. He was all man. He absolutely exhi exhibited a form of humbleness and of a servant. Paul would warn us in Romans 12, 3, for I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. Boy, what a reminder. But notice in verse 12, put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, that's us, that's your identity, that's who you are, set apart, bowels of mercy, put on kindness, 
Put on humbleness of mind. But then notice the next word. What's the next word, folks? What is it? Meekness. I remember telling you this last time. And uh, I don't know where I got it from. I, I heard it first from Adrian Rogers. But I don't know if it's his or if he got it from somewhere. You really never know. Uh, but he said that meekness is not weakness. But it's power or strength under control. And I believe that to be true. A missionary was speaking to a bunch of kids. It was trying to teach them the lesson in Matthew 5, 5 that says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. He was trying to teach them that lesson, and so he thought that he would be expounding great knowledge unto them. And he asked the boys and girls that were there, he says, What does meekness mean, boys and girls? And one little boy raised his hand, and he's like, Oh boy, what's this little kid going to come up with? And I'm going to tell you, I think it is a wonderful statement, and I've never forgotten it. And that's probably why it's always been record recorded. Here's what this little boy said about meekness. He says, People who are meek or meekness are those who give soft answers to rough questions. A little boy said that. And uh, I take the story as true, uh, being that it was a missionary. Meekness is those who give soft answers to rough questions. Meekness is marked by courtesy and a spirit of submission. You know, the word meekness was used of a soothing kind of word or terminology. It, it, was, it was used as something and defined as if a cult... A young horse had broken, had been broken. If you know a horse, when, when if they're wild, they have to be tamed. And, and if you know a horse, uh, really it's a surprise that any horse would ever be tamed because they're very strong animals. Did you know that? They're very big beasts and they're very strong. They basically can do whatever they want to do. But it's amazing to me how people can break or calm a horse. A horse is a very powerful animal when it's not under control. And they have to break a horse in. Which means it can be easily controlled and turned in any direction by the will of its master. Now I want you to think about that. And Paul says, put on therefore, beloved and holy, meekness. He's saying, you and I need to stay broken by God. We don't need to get ahead of God. We don't need to think we know more than God. We need to be humble before God. And Jesus, the Bible says, was meek and lowly in heart. That's how the Bible describes your Savior. He said we were to come unto him and learn of him, the Bible says. His life demonstrated those who were meek of one who was meek and gentle. We are to put on bowels of mercy. We are to put on kindness and humbleness of mind and meekness. But then would you notice the last thing there in verse 12? Put on long-suffering. And boy, this is a big one. Long-suffering literally means long temper. If you could think of it this way, long-suffering is of someone who has a long fuse. Long-suffering, long fuse. It means wrath that is put far away. This person who is long-suffering does not have a quick temper, ready to spout out at any moment. They're a volcano, ready to erupt at any moment. A short-tempered person speaks and acts impulsively and lacks self-control. A long-suffering person can put up with people or circumstances that provoke him or her. And this trait speaks of patience when dealing or relating with people. I don't know if you are a hothead. 
I don't know if you are short-tempered. I don't know how long it takes you to get from kind of to mad. I don't know how long that trip is for you. But verse 13 then goes into something else about the need of verse 13 because if we don't apply verse 12, then there's going to have to be verse 13. And we'll get to verse 13 in just a moment. But I would say to you that most people, every one of you, and I don't know of any of you that uh, how you grew up or, or your life really before Christ, but I would say that most people at some point, uh, whether big or small, doesn't really matter, that's not important, but that most people before salvation had a temper, a short fuse. A lady came to Billy Sunday after he had preached a message about self-control, not having a temper, and being kind, and returning uh, uh, wrath with a soft answer. The lady come up to Billy Sunday, and she said, I want you to know, I have nothing, there's nothing wrong with losing my temper. She says, and I'll prove it. She says, I just blow up, and then it's all over. She says, what kind of problem is that? I just blow up, and then it's over. And Billy Sunday replied to her these words. You act just like a shotgun. And look at the damage that a shotgun does. Any questions? That's what a temper does. And sometimes we want to kind of categorize this. Well, I'm able to move on quickly. Well, moving on quickly does not mean that you have resolved the matter. Moving on quickly means that you just got it off your chest, but everyone else has probably been left in the wake. Paul says, put on, therefore, bowels of mercy. He says, put on kindness. He says, put on humbleness of mind, meekness. And then he says, put on, obviously, in verse 12, long-suffering. See, a characteristic of the new life of you and I should be someone who is patient. Patient. That is something that uh, I have had to learn over the years, to be patient. I don't like to be patient. I don't, I don't like to wait. The coffee in my Keurig, that all you have to do is put a cup in there, push the thing down, and mash a button. That's all you got to do. I mean, you got to fill it up with water, but you, you, you just put these cups in there. I don't want to wait for that to do it. I want the cu For some reason, I want it to already know what I want, and when I walk in my closet there, I want it to be a cup of coffee. Now, I'm going to tell you something. That's an impatient person. I'm, I'm impatient with myself. Hurry up. What's taking so long? You know what I mean? And, and, and by the way, that... That's a quality, a characteristic that we have to work on. And that is something that become very irritating. And that's why Paul goes right from verse 12, by the way, into verse 13. Why? Because you folks deal with this too. It ain't just the preacher. It's you -ins. You know what you means? That means you all. And a lot of times, that's northern you -ins. And, um, and, 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 that's youths. All right, you youths pipe down. That's for youth in New York. They say youths. And um, in verse 13, Paul goes right from verse 12 to verse 13. Why? Because these next ones you are going to need with certain people. Notice what Paul says in verse 13. We just went through this with our family. Forbear and forgive. He says, verse 13, forbearing one another... And forgiving one another. Forbearing. Forgiving. I don't know if you know what a linguist is. 
A linguist is a person who studies languages. They are skilled in languages and often they are skilled in teaching languages. Linguists say this, the ten most pleasant words in the English, English uh, language is this. Now listen to this. The ten most pleasant words. I don't, I don't know where they get this stuff. I don't make this stuff up. I, well, the, the internet might make stuff up, but this is where I got it. Are dawn, D-A-W-N, like the dawn. Hush. Lullaby. Chimes. Tranquil. Golden, luminous, I, I don't, murmuring, I, I don't know how that's a pleasant word, mist and melody. I, I, I just, I, I find that quirky, but I don't know who these linguists are, but they're crazy. And um, but that, they say that's the 10 pleasant words, the, the most 10 pleasant words there. Here's the 10 most expressive words. Expressive, alone, mother. Death, love, revenge, tranquility, forgotten, friendship, no, and faith. That's the most expressive words. When I think of Bible words, I think of sin being a sad word. And I think the word forgive is a beautiful word. Paul here is in the context of putting off and putting on. The whole point about what linguists say, whether you agree with them or not, is that our words mean something. Words have value. The Bible says out of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Paul uses in verse 13, would you notice this, uh, uh, um, about living like a Christian. Here, here, here's something as we, we, we've looked at the manner and the method and the motive for living like a Christian. I want you to focus on these words. Notice the first word. He says forbearing one another. I want you to think of that word forbearance. Forbearance, forbear. That word forbear means to endure. It means to put up with. Um, I, I don't know if you were around family at Thanksgiving. I don't know if you're going to be around family during Christmas time. I wonder if every person that you're going to be around at Thanksgiving time is, is going to be just totally awesome. I wonder if there's a few people that you have to be around at Christmas time that you might categorize as putting up with. After all, it's Christmas. See, forbearance means to be patient. Now, here's really a good thought, and I want you to never forget this. Forbearance means to be patient with the faults of another. It means to be patient with the faults of another. It means to tolerate others when they irritate you. <laughs> it means to hold yourself tall and erect under the burden that is imposed upon you by another. Have you ever had that to happen on you? I bet you have. I wonder how good you and I have been at forbearance. Because Paul said forbearing one another. Sometimes we have no patience with one another. We are not patient with, listen, the faults of each other. I'm not patient with it. There are many circumstances each day where this admonition that Paul is giving us is needed. I'll tell you some places that it's needed. It's needed at the place that you work with and the people you work with on a daily basis. You know, your co-workers need for you to be forbearing. 
They may not know this word. They may not be identified with this word. They not, may not be a believer. So obviously they may not even know this. And if they are a believer, maybe they have never been taught. Maybe they don't know how to handle people. Maybe they don't know how to handle their boss. Maybe they don't know how to handle you. Uh, but the point is, you ought to be forbearing. You ought to show this in your workplace. Maybe it's with... Uh, the people that you are, are around all the time. Maybe it's children uh, that you're around all day long. Maybe it's where uh, you're at home all day. Or maybe uh, for our uh, uh, school staff, maybe it's because they're in the same classroom with children all day long. And so they got to put up with a lot. Maybe it's a husband and wife that live under the same roof. And they have to forbear one another. Maybe it's a, where we need to apply it where believers are serving together in a ministry together like ourselves. And we got to forbear one another. We got to put up with one another. We, we got to be patient with one another. Maybe you're not getting it as fast as the next person wants you to get it. But we got we to gotta forbear one another. We got to realize that there is a learning curve and there is a learning grave here. And one of the marks of maturity is the ability to interact or, or, or constructively in a group. But see, any time that you have two parts that are moving, if you were to put two parts together, you start rubbing them enough, and you rub them fast enough, you know what's going to happen? You're going to have what they call friction. Mary Francis, you should have been doing this for the entire service to warm them hands up. And if you do this long enough, you know what's going to happen? Come on, what's going to happen? You're going to get tired. Poor illustration. No, stay with me now. What's, what's going to happen? No, not tired. They're going to heat up. The thing's going to forbear, people! Intense, put up with. It's going to get intense. It's going to get hot. It's going to be some friction. And the longer you rub it, the warmer it gets. And sometimes when people rub you the wrong way, it heats up a little bit. But you know what love and forbearance is? Love and forbearance is the oil that keeps human relationships running smoothly. Forbearance is what keeps the friction from happening between people and believers. And I'm going to say to you that if you find yourself always, always, always being contentious or someone's contentious with you, I can say that verse 13 needs to be applied as the oil. You need to put something in there. See, friction is defined as the resistance that one object, that one object encounters with another. Friction. And that's what happens. Do you know what a synonym for the word friction is? Let me give you some synonyms for the word friction. Discord, strife, conflict, disagreement, contention, dispute, dissension, fighting. And by the way, if you look this up in the dictionary, there's a whole, whole bunch more words for friction. And often that's what happens even amongst believers, is it not? There's all these things that happen. Instead of putting forbearance in there and being able to put up with one another, being patient with the faults of another, what is it about this life that makes this virtue of forbearance forbearing so necessary and needed. I thought of a few myself, and maybe this is the way it is for you. I don't know. I don't know what, how this would be described for you, but I thought of a few. I'll tell you one thing that's one that has to be have forbearance applied to is the peculiar habits that people have. Some people have peculiar habits of biting their nails. 
I might tell you that's just nasty. I don't bite my nails, but just because I don't bite them doesn't mean I didn't used to bite them. I have bite. I don't know anybody that hasn't at one time ate some fingernails. Now, folks, if you have, if you're starting to eat your toenails, we're going to buy you a food certificate somewhere because you must be hungry. But sometimes we are so irritated by people's peculiar habits. It, it might be something like, you know, um, there was one time that we were invited over to somebody's house and for dinner, and uh, they served uh, a particular dish that involved. Uh, salad, and so they used salad dressings. And while they were passing the salad dressing, the guy before me, who was the host of the home that I was at, uh, decided that he would use the same dressing that I wanted. And so before I got it, he got it and squeezed his dressing out. But uh, unto his unconscious n- nature, he didn't know what he did. But as soon as he got done, he went and then passed it. Now, folks, I'm doing my best to love people like Jesus loves them. But I'm going to have to fast on the night that you pass the dressing that you just licked. All of us have little habits, by the way, that are annoying. Know what I'm saying? We all have habits that we probably ought to forbear. We do. We all have them. And by the way, here's what society has done. And, and, and we've, we've bought in on it. They've titled it OCD. Let me tell you something. Before there were OCDs, you just had a, you had, there was something wrong with you. That's what they'd say. There's something wrong with him or her. But now they've titled it uh, 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 Ticks, Tax, Patty Wag. I don't know what they call them. You know, God has an answer for all, all this stuff, which is really amazing to me. And you laugh at this because you know it's true. But the fact is, the Apostle Paul wrote on the Holy Spirit's inspiration, says, forbear one another. Is your habit so annoying that I'm going to allow it to drive me to be impatient and unkind to you or avoid you altogether because I can't stand your annoying, peculiar habit? Now, if you lick the lid of a... I'm going to go back. If you keep licking the lid, I'm going to have to eventually mention that one. All right? I'm going to have to talk about that one. But other stuff, you know, just forbear. Personality differences. Some people are just strong-willed. Some people are just independent. Some people don't know when to be quiet. Stop talking. Okay, now that I have your attention, now we can have a conversation. Some people can't do that. Some people always have to be right. They're never wrong. Or at least they never appear to be wrong in their own mind. Their reality is, is just a wrong perception. They're never wrong. And, and if they are, they're, they're too prideful to even admit it they're wrong. They'll somehow twist it to make you think that you caused it. I don't know. Just something weird. And it's this peculiar, uh, annoying, uh, uh, different personality conflict that they have. But we all have them. Paul says forbear. Selfish desires. Have you ever noticed that people just like to be first in line at anything? Just watch some of our fellowships here that we have. Pastor, you guys go on and get up front. No, I'm, I'm going to wait for you because you guys are going to knock us down if we get up in front of you. It's no big deal. Just let them go. Don't let it irritate you anymore. So what? They got to be first. Let them clear out of the way and I'll get more when they leave because they'll already be filled up and there'll be a lot more because someone will bring late. They'll bring something late, I promise you. And they won't get in that because they'll already be filled up on crackers. Just, hey, just forbear it. It's no big deal. 
forbear one another. To be patient with one another's faults. Do you have any faults tonight? Do you? Do you have any faults tonight? I'm not asking you what they are. Do you have any? Do you have anything that could be qualified? Maybe if, if someone really knew you or maybe that someone does know you, they'd raise their hand and say, man, that's irritating. How, how many of you just say, I probably have maybe something like that. Awesome. You know what? Hey, let's forbear one another. How about proper manners or etiquette are not taught frequently today? Thank you, please. How about those? How about trying that on? And don't correct my kids when they say, yes, sir, no, sir. All you need to say that. Yes, they do. Because that's what we taught them. So don't re-correct our kids. You're, you're not in charge of that. But we are. And we expect our kids to have that. Not because we were taught that. I wasn't required to do that. But we believe it's right. Especially to elderly. Or those who are older. Whatever elderly means. Anyone who's older. May I share something with you and... Um, one of the most irritating things to me is that when people chew with their mouth open I have to forbear because I just want to go over and grab their lips and go you aren't a cow Put that thing down. People who smack while they're eating. People who talk to you and look the other way while they're talking to you. You know, you know what I'm saying to you folks tonight? Are you getting what I'm saying to you? People who won't look you in the eye anymore when they talk to you. Folks, I'm, I, I say, well, where's that in the Bible? That isn't in the Bible, but forbear is means that you have to just be patient with people's faults. Maybe it isn't your conviction, or maybe it is your conviction. I have to be honest with you, you can't force that upon another person. So my resolve is to do what's biblically and when something that may be a little quirk to me or to you and it gets us worked up, we just have to forbear because it says forbear one another. And that's putting on the new man. I want to look like Jesus more. I don't want to have to be tweaked by some silly, annoying habit that we all have. We all have them. But Paul says forbear one another. I think sometimes we have this expectation that people ought to act just like we act. I think it's good for us to give up the false expectation that people have to be just like you. Because they don't. People will not always act decently and people will not always act respectfully towards you. See, so what do you do? You forbear. Well, he, 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 he shouldn't have done that to me. Well, she shouldn't have acted that way. He should have known better. I hear that one all the time. They has, should have been more attentive to me. What's interesting about all those statements is that all those statements are always directly related to someone else receiving the blame instead of the individual that is speaking taking personal responsibility. It's always somebody else's fault. Waiting in line, being cut off in traffic. Don't you love it when people text while you are having a conversation with them? That's pleasant. 
So how are you doing? Oh, I'm doing fine. Yeah, that, that's fine. Yeah, go ahead and ring that up too. That's perfectly fine. No, I, no, I don't want that, but um, that, that'll be good. That's fine. Okay, what, what is it now? We have disconnected so much that we cannot have a conversation. That's why people's language skills are diminishing because no one talks anymore. And yet all these things may be changing. And folks, you're not going to stop social media. You're not going to stop people from having the capability of texting. But I'm going to tell you, if, if it's not involved directly in your home and you can't help change it, then you need to apply verse 13, forbearing one another. Say, what will that help me do? It help you live like a Christian. That's what it help you do. Forbear. We've spent enough time here tonight. I, I'm, I'm going to pause here tonight. And uh, we've spent quite a bit of time in God's Word. And I don't want to go to the next part because it may get a little bit lengthy. But folks, could we review verse 12 and 13? Just look at it. Let me read it to you. Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another. Would you look up here? Here's one thing that you can remember. There isn't one person in this room that you can control or change except you. <laughs> husbands, you can't change your wives, and wives, you can't change your husbands. But you can change yourself if you choose to. I'm reading a book now. I'm not going to tell you the author. I, I, I don't agree with everything in the book. And so if I uh, do that, uh, uh, it may get a total, um, uh, you know, solidified uh, agreement that, uh, or thought process that I agree with everything that's in a book, but I don't. But 99.99% uh, of it's really on target and simply entitled this. The book's entitled this. Um, I need to change. So help me God. And it's just simply about this. Some of the smallest, most insignificant things that you can kind of look over in your own life. Because you're so busy looking at the changes that everyone else needs. When this book is a book written to me and you. And yes, it's a book to be preached, it's a book to be taught, but it's a book to be received. When it's Jesus who's wanting to work on you. And so sometimes it's best to get your eyes off of what everyone else needs to do. And just find out, God, what would you have me to change? What would bring you most glory about my life? Which means, and by the way... You cannot do that without that word change. That's the hardest part of the book. Because this book is about change. God loves you the way you are, but he loves you enough not to leave you that way. This book is about change. And forbearing one another is certainly change. To be patient with your faults and with my faults. I need you to be patient with my faults. I need my family to be patient with my faults. Because they know them more than you. I need to be patient with their faults because I know them better than you. And we need to be patient with one another because that's what God has asked us to do. And I want to be obedient to my Savior. Let's pray. Father, I pray that as we search your word that we will obey it. And yeah, a few of the things tonight, obviously, there's just personal idiosyncrasies that really amount to nothing. They're just silly and personal illustrations that mean nothing, but somehow we can make those a focus and get what's important off track, and that is how are we living unto Christ? Am I living a life that is Christ-like? I want to live like a Christian. I call myself a Christ follower. 
And as believers, every one of us have your word to gain strength and help from. May we be obedient. Thank you for everyone being here tonight. I appreciate their heart to be in church. Thank you for our WANA program. May as they go home and everyone else, may everyone be safe. And may everyone have a Christ-filled week today, this week. May Christ be glorified in our lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I'm going to ask the ushers to come. Let's take the offering for tonight. And then we will be...